Good morning, viewers. Welcome to this session of teleconferencing. As you know, the topic for today's, section, uh, today's session is Perspectives on the Indian National Movement. And this session forms a part of your course, Foundation Course on Humanities and Social Sciences, FHS. And the theme for today's discussion forms a part of Block 3 of that course. Block 3 of the course goes into uh, the details and the discussion of the Indian national movement, various facets of the freedom struggle, how the struggle was uh, fought, uh, uh, the leaders who uh, fought the struggle, the strategies and so on. Today's discussion is not so much on the phenomenon of the national movement, but rather on the whole range of ways in which national movement has been looked at and studied by different historians and different sets of historians. So by perspective of the Indian national movement, by perspectives on the Indian national movement, we are going to be talking about the different ways, different perspectives with which the Indian national movement has been understood and studied. My name is Salil Mishra. Uh, I am from the Faculty of History and to discuss this with you, with me is on my left, Dr. Shashi Bhushan Upadhyay, a colleague in the Faculty of History, School of Social Sciences, who would be going into the various uh, historiographic trends and various schools uh, uh, which have uh, looked at uh, the Indian national movement and what are the differences and similarities among those uh, groups, among those uh, schools. Before I hand over to uh, Dr. Upadhyay, I would like to uh, start with I would like to set the ball rolling. I would like to start the discussion with two or three very, very general uh, 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 basic comments, and then I would request him to go into the uh, go into the actual uh, topic uh, for the day, which is perspectives on the national movement. Our contention is that the Indian national movement is important, not just in itself. But it's also important, it's also crucial because it provides us an understanding of modern India. So if you wish to understand modern India, nature of modern India, then our contention is that it's not possible to study modern India without going into a study of the Indian national movement. So it is a topic of enormous importance. It almost enjoys a certain centrality. It should exercise a centrality in discourses on modern India. It is also important in understanding the transformation of Indian society into some kind of a nation. So if you want to understand the process in which uh, uh, a very diverse, a very plural, in terms of religion, in terms of caste, in terms of language, uh, this diverse Indian society, if you want to understand the process in which this Indian society was gradually transforming into a modern national society, a modern na a nation, then I think again, uh, a study of the national movement is absolutely central and absolutely crucial. A crucial phenomenon like that th has been very heavily studied by uh, a number of historians and needless to say that not all historians really agree with one another. There might be certain common assumptions but uh, there are large areas of differences of perspectives among the historians and sometimes they do not even share common assumptions. So one way to open, uh, as it were, the discussion on perspectives of national movement is to really talk in terms of sets or groups of historians or schools of historians or historiographic trends, groups which may have certain basic assumptions in common and on the ba basic raw material, basic assumptions, a basic paradigm on the basis of which they have constructed their understanding of national movement. Given that, I think we can now go into a discussion of what are the different ways, different perspectives from which uh, uh, the phenomenon of the Indian national movement has been studied. I would now uh, like to request my colleague, uh, Dr. Shashi Bhushan Upadhyay to give us a sense, a whole range of what are these kinds of ways and then I would also request him to take up some of these uh, perspectives, some of these schools and go into some uh, uh, details, go into some discussion of that. Over to Shashi. Thank you, Salil. <coughs> uh, as uh, Dr. Mishra said, uh, 
there was a certain phenomenon called national movement, Indian national movement. And this was important because it was the national movement, particularly in the 20th century, which shaped our country, which shaped India as we know it today. So there was a certain centrality of this movement in the making of modern India. There is no denial of the fact that there was a movement. There were certain leaders. There were certain groups which followed which believed in the national movement and which participated actively in the national movement. So up to this point, there is a general agreement among all the historians. Nevertheless, all the historians who dealt with or who wrote about the Indian national movement did not quite agree with each other. There were wide divergences in their writings. and. Uh, in line with these divergences, we can divide the treatment of the national movement, perspectives on the national movement, and how the national movement was perceived into four broad categories of historians. One was the nationalist school, second was the Marxist school, third was the Cambridge school, and fourth was the subaltern school. These are the four broad schools. It is true that there were many other historians who worked outside any of these schools. Nevertheless, they also shared some assumptions or the other of some of these schools. And even those who did not share uh, many assumptions of any of these schools, they can be said to fall within the liberal schools who more or less broadly followed the perspectives are assumptions of one or two of these schools. So when we are going to discuss these four broad schools, we are going to take into account the fact that objectively speaking, there was a certain things, certain thing called national movement, Indian national movement, which shaped the future of India and the reality of India, the idea of India as we know it today. So let us start with the nationalist school. It was called nationalist school. It is called nationalist school because it believed that the Indian national movement represented the entire nation. This entire nation fell within a certain boundary, geographical boundary, and it encompassed all the classes, all the groups of people, all the ethnicities falling within that particular geographical boundary. And that it called a nation. And therefore, the, its perspective was inclusive perspective. And it believed that the Indian national movement represented the whole of the nation, the whole of the country, all the classes, all the genders, and everyone living within these geographical boundaries. So much so that it said, and it was proven by fact also, proven by many evidences, that the Indian national movement not only considered what it called the ethnic Indians within its uh, ambit, but it also included many of those who were not exactly born Indians. For example, many of the whites also were included within the uh, framework of the national movement. And it was understood that anybody who loved India and anybody who wanted India to be free belonged to this stream called the Indian National Movement. Therefore, the nationalist historians, the nationalist school of historians believed that the Indian National Movement was a democratic, liberal, all-inclusive movement which uh, did not exclude anybody and which wanted to bring within its ambit all the groups in Indian society. So that, was the that is the perspective of the Indian national movement. And some of the historians falling within uh, this trend uh, are Tarachan, uh, R.C. Majumdar in his earlier phase, and many such historians who has written volumes of uh, books on this theme. The next group of historians, the next school of historians which we are going to discuss, 
is the Marxist school of historians. The Marxist school shared many of the assumptions of the nationalist school. Nevertheless, it diverged also from that. And within the Marxist school, there is not a unilinear trend. There are wide divergences within the school and we will briefly discuss those. The Marxist school was in a sense founded by the book written by R.P. Dutt in the 40s, 1940s that is called India Today. And another book written by A.R. Desai, The Social Background of Indian Nationalism. These two books can be said to be foundational in the formation of the Indian Marxist historiography of Indian national movement. These two books brought out the basic outlines on which most of the Marxist historiography of Indian national movement is based. I will briefly outline the basic uh, points of these. The first assumption of both these books are that the Indian national movement, particularly in its leadership, <coughs> was bourgeois in nature that the leadership of the Indian national movement was bourgeois in nature. It was not the enlightened individuals only who participated and led the movement as was brought out by the nationalist school, but it was bourgeois in the sense that even though the Indian nationalist leaders did not themselves came from capitalist or bourgeois background, nevertheless they supported the interest of the Indian bourgeoisie, national bourgeoisie. However, A.R. Desai and R.P. Dutt, in certain senses, believed in some kind of instrumentalist approach towards the national movement, towards its leadership, in the sense that they said that the leadership, uh, although it may or may not have come from the bourgeoisie, nevertheless, it was a kind of instrument in the hands of the Indian bourgeoisie, and therefore, it led the masses, but not for the interests of the masses. It was for the interests of the bourgeoisie that it led the masses and molded them, them as such. As this, this was the basic assumption, and there much elaboration that in the earlier phase, it was the petty bourgeois, uh, big bourgeoisie in the earlier phase, then it came the petty bourgeoisie, and in the third phase, it was a nationalist, nationalist bourgeois which, who overtook the leadership, took over the leadership. However, when this school, the Marxist school developed and it was represented by some other historians, the most important among them was, uh, is uh, Bipan Chandra and Sumit Sarkar. Here the instrumentalist approach changes a little and they believed that it was not so much that these nationalist leaders were instruments in the hands of the bourgeoisie, rather their ideas were such that it helped the bourgeoisie. Although they themselves did not consciously favor any of the group in the society and they, particularly Bipan Chandra says that the Indian national movement was an all-class movement, nevertheless, so far as its direction was concerned, central direction was concerned, it was uh, favoring the bourgeois outlook of society, the bourgeois development of economy and uh, the nation. Similar was the case with uh, Sumit Sarkar. So we find that overall, with cer certain divergences, the Marxist school believed that despite being an all-class movement, the Indian national movement being an all-class movement, because among its participants, among its members, there were people from various classes of society, nevertheless, the leadership was, in certain senses, had bourgeois ideas. In ideas, it was it represented a kind of bourgeois development of economy and society. Now we come to the Cambridge School. The Cambridge School, uh, we say Cambridge School, uh, it is not a school in the sense that all the uh, practitioners of this school either belong to the Cambridge University or uh, they uh, taught there. Nevertheless, when it is started, it represented a certain trend. Uh, the basic outline is like this, that the Cambridge School believed that there was no contradiction between the imperialism and the Indian masses. Now, going back a little, both the nationalist school and the Marxist school believed that in Indian, under colonialism, the basic contradiction was between 
imperialism and Indian masses. And other contradictions can be there, but this was the major contradictions. The imperialist school believed, the Cambridge school believed that the contradiction was not between imperialism and the Indian masses, but the contradiction was within the Indians themselves. And therefore, it was the Indians who fought among themselves. This fight developed in a certain direction because of imperialist concessions and in order to garner those concessions, in order to garner those benefits, the Indians competed within themselves and thereby developed a kind of movement which was termed as the national movement. So the model is like this. It was the British imperialists, British government in India, which from time to time threw out certain concessions to the Indians. The Indians various groups of Indians who were div divided among themselves on the lines of caste, on the lines of community, on the lines of faction, they competed for those gains to get those, uh, to benefit from those gains and for this they fought among themselves and thereby developed various <coughs> movements. Some of them were communal movements, some of them were nationalist movements and that is that. that it was the nationalist movement by this definition was a movement developed as a result of competition among the Indians themselves. The uh, imperialist con contradiction with Im it's the contradiction of Indian people with imperialism had nothing to do with that. So that was the basic framework. Within Cambridge School we see two phases but we will discuss it later during our discussion. Now we come to the subaltern school. The subaltern school developed during 1980s. Uh, this school, right from its beginning, believed that the, there is not just one Indian national movement. There are various national movements. There are various kinds of nationalisms in India. These nationalisms can be along ethnic lines, along class lines, along group lines. And although they all contributed in some form or the other to towards the development of the nation, nevertheless, the Congress nationalism or the dominant nationalism was an elite nationalism. It was an elite phenomenon. And the mass nationalism, which had various uh, use, it has a lot of varieties, that mass nationalism belonged in different, to different groups, sometimes to certain tribes, sometimes to certain classes, sometimes to women. It has been variously distributed. So on the one hand, there was this elite nationalism represented by the Indian National Congress. And on the other hand, there are varieties of nationalism which contributed towards the making of the nation and which have never been taken into account by the historians, elite historians. So they said that all the histories written until now, until the subaltern uh, school wrote its own history, so all the earlier history was an elite, elitist history because it concerned itself either the bourgeois nationalist elitism or imperialist colonial elitism. So all the history including the Marxist history, Marxist historiography was in a certain sense elitist historiography because it did not take into account the mass nationalism and its autonomous character. That is what they emphasize that the mass nationalism was autonomous, was independent from the dominant nationalism represented by the Indian National Congress. So these are the four schools which uh, wrote about Indian nationalism and gave its various perspectives of Indian nationalism. If there are any questions on these, you may please send them or else we can also, if Salil has something to say about this, he may. Yeah, thank you, uh, Shashi. It seems uh, as I was listening to the discussion on the various perspectives or on different schools, particularly the nationalist school, nationalist historiography, nationalist history writing, Imper uh, Cambridge school and the Marxian history writing. It occurred to me that it is very interesting that one can link some of the assumptions of these historians to concrete political practices of the time. In a way, one can see that these perspectives, these different perspectives, they were developed by ideologues, practitioners of politics, and also by professional historians. 
even though their areas were separate, but you can see certain common underlying assumptions among the, uh, the ideologues, the practitioners of politics and the professional historians. What I mean to say is that you can, in the nationalist historiography, you can see that the nationalist ideologues, the practitioners of nationalist politics during the course of the national movement and professional nationalist historians, they started out with certain common assumptions. And this point can also be generalized about Marxian ideologues, practitioners of communist politics and Marxian historians. In the case of Cambridge School, this point also applies in the sense that we can see some of the assumptions of imperialist ethnographers, scholars, writers, the imperialist historiography the practices, the concrete political practices of British imperialism and a variant, its version can be seen as developing in the form of Cambridge School. They are not, the three are not really very, very separate, but one can see some of the common assumptions, some of the common ideas on which they construct their understanding of the national movement. Uh, this is the one point that, that occurred to me. The second point uh, that I thought was interesting is that these perspectives of the nationalists of, the, of Cambridge School or imperialists and of Marxists, they were constructed over a period of time and on the basis of within they had common assumptions but vis-a-vis -vis each other they had very, very different assumptions and I could say very different raw material with which they worked. For instance, I mean to, to, to spell the point, for nationalists, it was the nation and the unquestionable existence of an Indian nation, which in a way, which in a way forms the bedrock of the positions of nationalist ideologues, practitioners of nationalist politics and also professional historians, Tarachan particularly of about whom uh, Shashi talked about. For Marxists, it was the class and the division of the world, essentially the division of world in terms of various classes and an understanding of world history in terms of specific social formations. So not British rule but colonialism which is linked to capitalism which forms a very important part of, 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 the, of, the, of the philosophical assumptions of Marxian ideologues practitioners of communist politics and also Marxian historiography, professional Marxian historians, uh, 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 professional Marxian historiography that developed in India particularly from the 1940s onwards, R.P. Dutt and A.R. Desai. For imperialists, it was not so much the category of nation and class, the modern categories of nation and class. For them, they either did not exist in India or were not operative, were not important. For imperialists, and also for so many of Cambridge historians, it was the, there were the, it was the primordial categories of caste, language, religion and later also faction. This was how the British ethnographers, British scholars, imperial ideologues, the various reports that were written during, British, during the national movement, Rowlett uh, committee report, they, under, they developed a particular understanding of the Indian society. Their Indian understanding of Indian society was that modern categories of class and nation were either not operative, were either not functioning or simply did not exist or were not important. In order to understand Indian society, the categories that were important were categories of caste, were categories of religion, were categories of language and also factional categories, self-interests, local interests, interests of one group against the other. Lot of these assumption points, it will be interesting to see, actually go on to feed into the Cambridge historiography, Cambridge school that develops. So it will be interesting to see that the kind of historiography and basic concerns and the formulations of the historiography, particularly these three, the nationalist historiography, the Cambridge school historiography and the Marxian historiography, some of their basic assumptions can actually be traced back during the course of the national movement, their assumptions can be traced back to the assumptions of na practitioners of nationalist politics, practitioners of left-wing communist politics and the practitioner, practitioners of imperialist politics, the rulers, the ethnographers and so on. So there is a kind of a link uh, 
between this is the kind of a link that they are very different from each other but within there is a similarity there is a similarity between imperialist perspective and Cambridge school perspective there is a similarity between the existing communist perspective and Marxian historiography practitioners of nationalist politics and nationalist historiography and they are all very different uh, uh, from each other we will have more to say on this but I now want to get back to Shashi with the question he said that there are two levels of uh, Within Cambridge School, there are two levels or two stages or two kinds. Now, this it was not very clear to me as to what he meant and what is the kind of a shift from one to the other. So, maybe we can spend some time talking about these shifts that take place within the Cambridge uh, uh, School historiography. Uh, yes, uh, Salil. I spoke about two uh, phases of Cambridge School, but before coming to that, uh, let me elaborate your point a little because uh, I completely agree with that, that there are certain assumptions which have been shared between the practitioners, between the leaders, uh, ideologues of the movement and the professional historiographers, professional historians. The whole thing how to view the Indian society started, in fact the writing of history itself started with the imperialist historians, colonialist historians in the late 18th and early 19th century and they believed most of the time that India was not a nation. Not only that India was not a nation, there were various groups living within this geographical boundary which were constantly at war with each other. So although they believed that India was not a nation before say 18th century in which they may, be, may have been right but at the same time they believed that India there is certain eternity about the existence of communities for example, castes for example. So although it is not a nation the caste have been eternal, communities have been eternal, although the nation has never been in existence in India. So they wanted to see various divisive tendencies within the Indian society so that it was also related, their assumptions, their ideal ideas were related to the mechanics of power, how to control Indians. And Indians could be controlled only uh, mainly, primarily, if they could be shown to be divided among themselves, to be constantly at war among themselves, so that the hand of a superordinate power was needed. So, this was their basic assumption right from the late 18th century. In the early 19th century, the first major work of history which put put a stamp on this kind of interpretation of Indian society was by James Mill, A History of India, a huge voluminous work which is so contemptuous of Indian civilization that the later colonialist historians had to criticize it and move it, move away from that. Nevertheless, the assumption of many colonialist historians have been that India was not a nation and it was a society divided into castes and communities and languages and which never saw any kind of unity in its history. In fact, it never had any history. So that was the basic assumption. Now the nationalist historians and nationalist leaders earlier also, they understood the problem, they thought and they realized that India was not a nation. Nevertheless, they also thought that India was not eternally divided between communities, castes and various other sectarians, uh, sectarian loyalties and India was a kind of nation in the making. They said that India was a nation in the making. But the later pro professional historians also took it from them and they to counter the imperialist history they asserted that India has been a kind of some has been not a nation exactly, but it had certain kind of uni unity right since uh, say the Vedic ages are probably when the Harappan civilization was discovered right since Harappa. So they saw 
they asserted a kind of unity which may not have been a national unity. Nevertheless, it was a kind of cultural unity, a geographical unity. The Marxists also saw that the existence of classes and it, was, it could also be traced to the communist practitioners in the uh, early 19th century. And nevertheless, even among Marxists, there was certain development of tra trend, uh, the whole development of ideas. So we find that the later historians become more sophisticated. They don't find any kind of instrumentalist relationship between the Indian national leaders and the bourgeoisie. Also, they don't see that the Indian national movement or the Indian society was so sharply divided between classes that they could not be mobilized together with the same idea of nation. So this view came, uh, this view changed even within the Marxist historians. Now coming to the Cambridge School. The Cambridge School, right since its beginning, shared a lot of assumptions with the colonialist or the imperialist school. Those assumptions were that India was N never a nation, it never had any unity, cultural or otherwise. It was divided into various communities, caste groups. And these were the basic motive force in the Indian development or the development of any movement. Now in its first phase, people, historians like Anil Seel believed that these, the middle classes were in the leadership of the national movement. These middle classes were the English educated middle classes and they derived all their ideas, all their energy, their inspiration from the British. And they started the movement because the British rule wanted to share some of its powers, very minimal though in the earlier phases, but some of its authority with the Indians. Now, they threw out certain crumbs, so to say. In fact, Daniel Seel, Seel says that. They threw out certain crumbs to the Indians. And these leadership wanted to use, wanted to gain those crumbs, wanted to eat those crumbs. And thereby, they started a movement. Now, because the Indian society was divided along the lines of caste and community, it has to be mobilized, the people have to be mobilized, had to be mobilized along those lines only. The leadership, therefore, was divided along those lines as were, as were the followers. So, according to Anil Seel and the earlier groups of uh, Cambridge historians, the national movement was not the result of a contradiction between the Indian people and colonialism, but it was a result of competition between caste and caste and between community and community. So it was a kind of competition between Hindus and Muslims and the competition between various castes that gave rise to, that provided the inspiration, the momentum for this movement. Now, when the Cambridge historians in the later phase, they became more sophisticated, they saw empirically that in many regions, in many places, it's not that all the caste people were mobilized behind a certain caste leaders. Although there were certain caste associations, but the bigger mobilizations, even in the early 19th century, uh, in the uh, early 20th century and late 19th century, they were not behind a certain caste leaders. So they came out with another idea, and that was the idea of faction. They said it was the factions which were responsible for the mobilization and for competition between themselves. And these factions united people of various castes and communities. Nevertheless, the factions themselves were not united and they operated under certain rules. Now, this whole horizontal division among the Indians along the lines of caste and community changed to vertical divisions among the Indians along the lines of faction where uh, there is a certain leader and it comes down to the gra uh, grassroot level in a certain vertical line which is called a faction. Now although the differences were here, nevertheless the basic motivation for the national movement was what some of the historians, some of the critics of the national uh, Cambridge school have called the animal politics. 
So Cambridge historians in both the phases believed that the national leaders, national movement was a kind of animal politics in which there is no role of ideas. It's only a kind of basic motivational, basic instincts which worked that you have to grab certain things either it's the money or it's power or anything. So it's just instinctual reaction towards those gains and it's not a kind of ideas which overcomes the basic divisions, the basic uh, animal instincts of humans and develops into that. So it was not an idea driven movement, it was a passion, instinct driven movement. So that is the basic things which unites both phases of Cambridge School. Yeah. 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 Thank you Shashi. I think as now we come to uh, kind of, uh, we come to the end of the discussion in the last five or six minutes, uh, let me, uh, sp uh, if there are no questions, let me just spell out two or three things. Now, by now it should have been very clear to you that our discussion today has rested upon certain ch certain continuities and discontinuities, certain commonalities and differences. For instance, we have emphasized a commonality of ideologues, practitioners of politics and professional historians within one stream and likewise ideologues, professional historians and practitioners of politics within another stream. So on the basis of this, if we were to let's say form, make three pools as we have tried to do, uh, the imperialist stroke Cambridge pool, the nationalist pool and the Marxian pool. And within these pools, within each of these pools would be practitioners of politics, professional historians, ideologues. And likewise in the, in the, in the uh, imperialist pool and the nationalist pool. Now, the interesting, the, and they have their differences with each other. The interesting thing here to see uh, would be how these pools or how these sets of ideas or how these assumptions relate to each other. Is there any kind of a dialogue? between them or are these completely insular, exclusive, internally united, externally differentiated pools of ideas. And I think it would be interesting to see that in whichever form there is, an, there is a dialogue in time and space, they do address each other, they do point out the silences of the other, the weaknesses of the other, one is found uh, and they pro also provide each other's critiques. So in a way there is a dialogue between these traditions but uh, between these ideas but it would still be important to recognize them as separate historiographic ideas and assumptions, whole pools of ideas. Now in, uh, to take an example of this, the assumptions of nationalist ideologues, practitioners of politics and historians, professional historians. Some of their assumptions were made almost in reaction to some of the assumptions that had been held by the imperialists. So lot of the direction which nationalist historiography took was also in reaction to the directions of the ideas of the imperialist schools. So if the imperialists emphasized early imperialist 19th century of which Shashi talked about, if they emphasized dark ages in India, in, in Indian history or if they looked upon the Indian past as dark as some of the uh, liberal uh, 19th century historians, James Mill for instance did, then Indian nationalists and ideologues, they reacted to it by, reacted to it by constructing golden ages and they went back to India's past and tried to show, tried to demonstrate the golden ages of the India's past. If the imperialists talked about the backward, if the imperialists talked about the unchanging, static uh, nature of Indian society, then Indian historians, nationalist historians reacted to that by providing an alternative. If the uh, imperialist scholars and historians, they emphasized the backwardness, backward nature of the Indian society, the nationalists accepted the argument but explained the backwardness not in terms of intrinsic Indian features but in terms of the nature of the British rule, the drain of wealth. So they accepted backwardness but they blamed the British rule for some of those backwardnesses. And lot of these ideas which were developed by the early nationalists, practitioners of politics and ideologues, they were carried forward, they were carried over 
they got carried over into the nationalist historiography and formed a part of the nationalist historiography. Likewise, the Cambridge School, it did try and emphasized some of the silences of the nationalist history writing, nationalist historiography. So in this manner, it will also be interesting. Today there is no time, but it will be interesting to see how these different pools of ideas, they do get into some kind of a dialogue with each other. How they build themselves on the, uh, build themselves as a reaction to the ideas of the other schools. So if, 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 if the imperialists emphasized disunity, nationalists emphasized unity and they emphasized unity so much that they actually ignored and overlooked the internal contradictions of the Indian society, the divisions of the, in the, within the Indian society along lines of class and caste and so on. Marxist historiography then emphasized the internal divisions, internal contradictions within the Indian society but being Marxists they focused primarily on the divisions of class. So the Marxists looked upon the Indian society in terms of the various classes, the peasants and the zamindars, the workers and the bourgeoisie and the middle classes. So it is in this process of kind of dialogues by focusing on the other person's silences, by reacting to the ideas of other person, yet retaining a focus on one's own assumptions. Marxists on class, nationalists on uh, nation and imperialists on primordial categories of caste and religion. It is in this manner then these, that these traditions, these pools of ideas got into a dialogue with each other, reacted to each other, opposed each other, historians took over and all of them enriched and advanced our understanding of Indian society, Indian history and Indian national movement in particular. I would, uh, we come to the end of the discussion. Uh, I thank you all very much for listening to us and on behalf of uh, me and Shashibhushan, we hope that you would have enjoyed this discussion and you would have found it useful. Thank you very much.